So the format of this presentation is to give a general overview on the current state and future progress of pure mycelium materials and also go deeper in three uh, areas. Uh, so first, I will introduce mycelium uh, materials. Um, I will um, talk about fermentation strategies, uh, also one of the most promising applications so far, the mycelium leather, and um, after that, also about processing and functionalization of the mycelium. Uh, yeah, I need to think of changing slides, of course. <laughs> Uh, and in the second part, I will go over uh, three areas right for development. So first is the improving the production strains. Uh, second, uh, upscaling the production. And lastly, I will talk about uh, a couple of future applications. So let's start with introducing the organism. So mycelium is generally referred to as the root-like structure of filamentous fungi. Um, it's basically a dense network of hyphae, and the hyphae are the individual filaments that are all interconnected. So for the application of growing uh, mycelium materials, white rot fungi are very popular because uh, they grow on a range of, um, on a wide range of lignocellulosic biomass. The composite mycelium materials are composed of both the mycelium and the substrate. So in this flowchart, you can see how the production process, um, you can see the production process where a mold is filled with a substrate and inoculated uh, with the organism. And at the end of the incubation period, usually five to seven days, you end up with a stiff lightweight material very similar to styrofoam. So the mycelium composites as packaging alternatives for styrofoam are wonderful uh, solutions for the environment because styrofoam is a nightmare to recycle. It fills up 30% of the global landfills, it's just harmful chemicals and can take up to 500 years to decompose. Um, now let's have a look at the pure mycelium materials. So these are composed solely of the fungal organism generally. Um, they can be leather-like, they can be foam or sponge-like, or they can also be tender tissue uh, that are used as meat alternatives. Now let's explore some fermentation strategies. Uh, filamentous fungi used for biotechno biotechnological applications have been grown in bioreactor fermentation setups for several decades already. So this is a mature technology which allows a high degree of control over the process parameters and uses liquid substrate to grow the organism. So in the left picture, you can see how um, the researchers at VTT are able to have a continuous production of mycelium uh, tissue using bioreactor fermentation. But now, recent innovations in solid state fermentation showed new phenotypes of pure mycelium foam that grows out of the substrate at specific conditions um, so the, these conditions uh, are usually um, 30 degrees Celsius, um, so relative high temperature for, for fungi, uh, about 5% gaseous CO2 concentrations, uh, a high relative humidity, and also uh, air flows that deposit solutes on the top of the mycelium. And the driving force behind the outwards growth of the mycelium is supposedly due to the CO2 gradient that is created by cellular respiration in a substrate container combined with the already high CO2 concentrations in the uh, growth chamber. Here you can see how fluctuation in airflow rates and relative humidity affect dry density and consequently also the tensile strength of the material. Uh, this data is uh, originated from uh, Ecovative, as I uh, think most of you uh, are familiar with this company, which is uh, very innovative in the space of uh, mycelium materials. Uh, here are some of my own results for growing this foam-like phenotype in a very rudimentary DIY setup, where I managed to achieve uh, about one to two centimeters of aerial uh, hyphae growth. 
Now, this setup is uh, located inside the CO2 incubator and composed of two boxes connected by a hose with a fan circulating the mist. But when you fill fully optimize this setup, it is possible to achieve big volumes of foam and also vertical farming, which is very efficient. Now let's dive into the uh, mycelium leather application. So mycelium leather um, is a great alternative to animal hides and plastic leather because the ecological footprint of leather is coupled to animal farming, which produces enormous quantities of greenhouse gas emissions and is also responsible for deforestation. Unfortunately, this application has gained a lot of momentum because of the global market for leather and leather goods that is estimated at almost $400 billion. Now making a leather with mycelium can be achieved in several ways. When growing in a bioreactor setup, um, the biomass can um, be printed uh, as a paste but when growing the mycelium foam on a solid substrate, this can be compressed into a thin and compact tissue. It's also possible to stimulate or manipulate hyphae to create microscopic organized patterns similar to weaving or rope twisting, which enhances the material properties of the tissue, uh, like you can see in the uh, uh, image below. And the, the tissue and, and lastly you can also integrate uh, existing materials into the mycelium uh, being natural fibers polylactic acid synthetic polymers or nanocellulose and then you create some kind of uh, hybrid material now processing and functionalization of the mycelium now the most important element of the mycelium is its cell wall which provides a great structural support the cell wall of fungi is composed of nanoproteins beta-glucans and chitin or chitosan. Um, without going too deep into the details, uh, um, uh, you can see here uh, how the, the chitin and chitosan backbone um, really uh, is, is, is the main um, platform for, for chemical uh, modification. So if you take a uh, chitin, you would like to deacetylate it to liberate the amine group, um, which is then referred to as, as chitosan. And, and uh, this allows to uh, add, uh, yeah, to, to, to modify the chemical structure and add new properties to the uh, mycelium. Um, here is a simplified flow chart of uh, pure mycelium material treatments with uh, all kinds of uh, chemicals that can be used to achieve um, the different modifications that enables to uh, functionalize, functionalize the mycelium. Now, uh, let's have a look on uh, which areas can be uh, developed and uh, for example, like improving the production strains. When using solid state fermentation, uh, usually white rot basidiomycetes are most popular uh, because they are the champions at degrading lignocellulose. Some examples are Ganoderma, Trametes, Pleurotus, Foams, or Schizophilums, but there are many, many more. Uh, in bioreactor bio fermentation, you can also use the white rot basidiomycetes, but certain popular species of ascomycetes, which are already used for several decades, like Penicillium, Aspergillus, or Trichoderma, can also be used uh, for biomass generation. And Besides the already described species, which is probably only 2 to 4% of the estimated existing uh, fungal biodiversity, there are many more unknown species who could provide new properties for future mycelium material applications. Now, a second um, way to improve production strain is through genetic engineering. This is uh, the major focus of my PhD project, but I, I will keep it simple. So another way to improve production strains is by genetically modifying um, the organism. And recent advances in CRISPR-Cas9 technology enables to bypass some tedious species-specific requirements by using uh, in vitro assembled ribonucleoprotein complexes. 
So these uh, RNPs are uh, translated into protoplasts, which you obtain by enzymatically digesting the fungal cell wall. And this results in spherical cells and integrations. Uh, yeah, so I won't go too deep into detail, but here on the picture, you can see on, on the right side, the, the hyphae that get digested and then form these spherical cells that afterwards are then used uh, to uh, genetically modify. Now here is an example of a su successful um, genetic engineered strain uh, by apples. So the deletion of the hydrophobin gene uh, resulted in a shift of material properties from natural materials to thermoplastic-like properties. Uh, Ecovative is also uh, very active in this space as they see the enormous potential. So uh, they have been engineering their uh, fungal strains, but also uh, bacteria that they use uh, in co-cultivation setups. But first I will talk a bit about, uh, for example, the modifications that they uh, did in Trametes. So there they overexpressed EGF1 um, and they made a knockout of NRG1 uh, for chlamydiospore production. This increased uh, the dispersion uh, in the substrates because chlamydiospores are very interesting to have uh, a fast uh, growth after the inoculation. Um, they also overexpressed chitin deacetylase, uh, which modulate then the chitin chitosan ratio uh, and can uh, enable stronger compressive modulus. In uh, Hyanoderma, uh, they also uh, modified uh, hydrophobin FRG1, which enhanced the aesthetics, um, produced waterproofing skins, and pro uh, prevent uh, water entering the composite material. Uh, which enabled the, the, the composites to be more resistant to swelling from humidity. Uh, and they also engineered uh, the glucan synthesis to have uh, two times increased glucan production in the cell wall. For the, uh, for the bacterial strains uh, in Bacillus subtilis, they uh, engineered um, polyhyma, uh, polyhyma glutamic acids uh, which creates a biofilm and uh, this biofilm production together with the mycelium, um, this increased by twofold the elastic modulus of their material. But for example, also <clears throat> uh, melanin production, uh, this melanin enables to have uh, uh, a, a protection against UV lights. So it, uh, it enables to have a longer uh, lifetime for the material and they also uh, in, in Streptomyces natalensis they uh, engineered production of natamycin which is a uh, fungicide against ascomycetes and so contaminant like trichoderma uh, will, will be enabled to grow and to uh, contaminate the, the mycelium. Now, uh, the upscaling, um, so according to the type of fermentation setup uh, that is used for uh, large volume production of mycelium, there are different challenges. Um, one that is common is the substrate. The substrate is important to always have uh, not too far away because if you need to import it from other countries or st stuff like that, you just uh, increase the uh, ecological footprint of the um, of the production process. Um, for the pure mycelium in solid state fermentation, there is an important CO2 supply that is needed. So this could be interesting to couple to industries which produce and, and uh, eject CO2 into the environment. So upcycling this CO2 could be uh, an interesting um, factor. And there's already a lot of infrastructure uh, today that exists for mushroom production. And it's not too much different. Uh, so this can be also used to uh, scale up the production 
of mycelium biomass. And now, yeah, a couple examples of future applications. So most of you probably already uh, heard about the uh, fashion uh, brands that are uh, using these mycelium uh, leather to create prototypes of uh, consumer products. And uh, I think there's a, a, a very big potential that in the coming years or decades, we'll be seeing a, an important shift towards uh, mycelium-based um, leather products. And finally, in maybe a more distant future, we'll be replacing all the meat production by, um, by uh, mycelium meat alternatives, uh, which are more ecological friendly to produce and who knows, uh, maybe when we'll be uh, traveling to uh, Mars or uh, deep space exploration, we'll be able to use uh, engineered melanin uh, mycelium materials uh, as a radio uh, protection um, in uh, space vessels. But this is this is speculation, but it could be interesting to, to have this uh, in the future. So this was it. And, uh, now I will leave the floor to uh, the next presenter. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. Good afternoon, good morning, <laughs> depending on where you are connecting from. Um, it is a great pleasure to be here today talking about our fungal leather project. Um, <clears throat> and uh, yeah, as Dylan just said, my name is uh, Manuel Arias. Uh, I'm originally from Costa Rica, but I live here in, in Finland uh, and I've been working now here at VTT for a while now and I am here today also with my colleague uh, Geza Silvai. Uh, Geza, if you would like to briefly introduce yourself. Yeah, just quickly. I am Geza. I'm uh, a scientist uh, in this project uh, together with uh, working together with Manuel and uh, I will then present some slides later after Manuel. Excellent. All right. So yeah, as you all already know, we are here today to talk about this uh, alternative material to animal leather, uh, this uh, fu uh, fungal leather. And we thought that why not to start first maybe with a brief introduction of uh, VTT for those who are not so familiar with the institution. So we are a research uh, organization and we are uh, government owned. So a lot of our, uh, most of our projects <clears throat> in great part like are funded by the government, but then we also have some other ones where we work with um, private clients to develop uh, specific projects uh, together with them. And at VTT, uh, sustainability sits really at, at the core of all our research uh, actions. Uh, and then it is through like business science and technology that we put all these three together to uh, take all these different um, innovations into actual implementation. And at VTT, we have uh, three business areas. Uh, the first one being carbon neutral solutions. And then we have uh, the digital technologies. And the third one is sustainable products and materials. And it is within this third one that we have this area of uh, biotechnology um, and where we focus also on these uh, new materials. <clears throat> and this is where our uh, research team um, is um, concentrated. And then now to kind of like um, you understand better like the landscape of how this research and development work is done at VTT. So as a research organization, we focus on applied research, but then we work very closely um, with universities uh, for, for all this uh, research and then also with the industry to then take this uh, research or like, yeah, these new materials and new uh, innovations and so on into actual uh, development. Um, for example, many times we get asked, um, you know, if, if uh, how can, uh, if we can manufacture these materials and so on, how much we can produce, but at VTT, uh, we don't manufacture these materials. We work with different pa partners to then um, manufacture these materials and take them into actual commercialization. And this is, uh, yeah, so this, uh, our, our project uh, is called uh, Filumium. 
And as you uh, all already know, it's an alternative material to animal leather and also synthetic leather. And it is a project uh, funded by uh, Business Finland. So it is funded by the government here in Finland. And uh, through this project, uh, it's been quite nice um, because we have been able then to focus on, on three different areas. So the first one being the markets. So we have been able then to not only uh, develop this material, but then also look, look into the different markets that could be um, where this material could be used for. Uh, then also we've been working very uh, much on the technical development of the material. And then the third aspect has been uh, the commercialization. So really looking into different commercialization paths uh, for, for this technology. And this is our team. And as you can see, it's uh, very multidisciplinary. Uh, so there's like myself with a background in design and sustainability, uh, Gesa with a background in biochemistry, but we also have uh, microbiologists, uh, material scientists, uh, people from, uh, from business, uh, physical chemistry and, and so on. So it's a nice mix of um, disciplines here and, and, and knowledge. And I think this is what has made this project um, quite, uh, I don't know, I would say like, yeah, quite fun and, and, and really like um, nice in the way that we have had like all these different knowledge blocks that have helped take these uh, initial ideas into actual um, slowly like possibly like com commercialization, but really like seeing how we, do, we went, we have gone from this lab scale into then really seeing how uh, it can be um, used in these more industrial processes. And for those who are not so familiar, uh, Simon already uh, talked about this, but <clears throat> yeah, so uh, what is mycelium? So as you might know, it's uh, these hair-like structures that grow uh, in the ground. So you have, you know, the, the, the mushroom, the fruiting body, but mycelium are these tiny little structures, uh, filaments growing in the ground. Um, and the process very much starts with a tiny little spore, then it grows into this long, um, Hypha, and then the, the collection of the network of this hyphae, then it's what we call mycelium, and this is what we are uh, working with in the lab. And there are two ways to grow this. There's uh, pure mycelium, as you can see on the right. Um, and then there's uh, this mycelium composites where you use uh, many times like a certain substrate where then the mycelium starts to colonize this uh, substrate and then grows. Uh, like binds it all together and then you have this sort of uh, composite. <clears throat> um, this uh, type of uh, approach has been uh, uh, um, widely used uh, at first when we started seeing a lot of mycelium. Uh, it was being used a lot uh, for packaging solutions, for example. And then this pure mycelium is quite nice uh, when, when one goes more towards this um, direction of the fungal leather. And then here, just to give you like a, a bit of um, um, background info on, on the, let's say maybe like history or, or the use of, of mycelium or like a uh, fungi itself, <clears throat> like mushrooms. Uh, so nowadays, yeah, we are seeing how a lot of uh, companies are, you know, growing these organisms in the lab and then taking them into actual uh, products and commercializing uh, these materials. But then the, 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 let's say like the art of uh, growing or like working with uh, mushrooms has been seen actually, uh, it has been used for, for many years already in, in local uh, communities. Um, and there are some papers actually that uh, talk about how this practice of working with fungi um, or like the, the mushroom um, has been seen for many years in Eastern Europe. Um, but then, yeah, nowadays we're seeing how this is also possible to um, not only, for example, collect the mushroom from the forest and process it, but then also we can grow it in the lab and, and, um, and use science to then fine tune the, the properties of, of the material. And then here I just wanted to, um, yeah, to kind of like bring also the topic of, of design and, and biotechnology and how they relate to each other and how this is really like a, a nice mix and, and, and it's something that uh, we are seeing more and more. 
and I think it's uh, extremely important this this um, connection between the two, because for example, through science or let's say like biotechnology, um, you get to really focus on the technological aspects of of this um, of these uh, materials. But then also when you bring design into the picture, you start thinking a bit uh, farther into maybe the aesthetics or the look and feel of the materials, which then in the end are quite important when you uh, are creating or like using these materials to create different products. And then also through design, one is able to uh, put these technologies and these materials into a certain context. Um, which often times in, in, in science, maybe you start focusing too much on technical aspects and then you kind of like forget about this bigger picture of how this technology then is going to be used, who are going to be the users, what are the products that could be used, that they could be used for. So by bringing these two together, really like they really complement each other and then you kind of like get it, um, let's say like 360 view of, 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 uh, of, of, of things that could be possible. And then, of course, in, in present times, then we are trying now to to understand how these technologies uh, look, uh, um, how, the, how they are, you know, how they work and how they can be developed farther. But then by bringing this to them, we can start thinking of these possible futures in terms of then what type of materials could be done or how technology then could be evolved and, and how the products could be manufactured. And to put this into context, so <clears throat> I always like to show this this example of, of the, the shoe. So um, on the left hand side, you have, you know, this normal shoe, how a, a shoe looks uh, pretty much uh, nowadays. Um, and we are used to in, 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 um, in traditional design processes to kind of like start defining like the problem. We start then uh, choosing maybe um, I don't know the colors, or, or for example, we will start designers start uh, sketching the the design of the shoe. <clears throat> uh, one can start also develop uh, working with material developers for the um, for customizing the material, you know, so that it fits kind of like the the design of the shoe. So this is kind of like how we have been working traditionally with materials, and then once we have the design, we start putting together this different pieces into the, the design, like we start putting together these different materials onto the design, but then <clears throat> by working together with the scientists, design, designers and, and, and scientists actually can change the way things are actually manufactured and, and, and made from the very beginning of the process. So on the left, uh, right hand side, there's a, an example of this other shoe uh, done done uh, with uh, wool and then also mycelium. And you can really see how here the whole shape of the shoe, like this shoe was needed and then also uh, mycelium was used. And you can see how then by bringing together designers and scientists, then you start kind of like changing the way things can be manufactured and how they can be actually, how they can also like look and feel. So this is like the nice thing I think about uh, combining the, the two. And then just to put this also into the context of uh, VTT, uh, this is a nice project that we did uh, uh, two years ago, more or less. And um, this is uh, Corva and it's a microbial headset. Uh, and this was a pretty interesting and, and fun project um, because then here we got to work with different partners <clears throat> like, um, for example, Alto University, uh, a design studio also here in Helsinki, uh, a journalist and so on. And it was quite nice because then we were thinking, okay, what if we put, because we were conducting like, you know, a lot of research at VTT on different materials, not only this fungal leather. And we were like, what if we choose this one element, let's, let's say like this headset then to put together these different uh, materials and show uh, how these materials actually could be used in, in, in the future. So then we created this proof of concept, this product that you see here. And it was quite nice to see all the attention that we got from the media and then also uh, from companies interested in these materials. Uh, so the brown one that you see in the middle picture, that's the fungal leather. But then we were also 
using here uh, not only pure mycelium, but then also mycelium composites, uh, spider silk, PLA, and some other ones. And it was quite nice to then, um, like I was mentioning earlier, to, to put science into a context and to productize this uh, scientific research, which many times maybe for non-scientists can, can sound quite uh, complex or, or yeah, hard, hard to um, relate to. And now I would like to then give the floor to my colleague, Keza. Yes. So I will tell you a bit of our uh, journey with the fungal leather. Manu, next, please. So I think most of you in the audience have worked with mycelium or you know what it is. And these uh, typically these composites are made with mycelium and some sawdust or, or something like that. Uh, and this process is called solid state fermentation. And uh, this together with the standing liquid cultivation methods uh, are uh, so unique ways of producing material that it, uh, it is uh, very interesting to uh, use it as a process to make a material because it converts uh, a feedstock and glues that together into a composite uh, in a very bottom up uh, process. So this uh, uh, biofabrication process is um, uh, kind of nature's way to produce materials. And because of this bottom-up approach, uh, probably there are structures and, uh, and uh, properties that are uh, coming through this growth process that are not possible to do in our like, technological way that we typically break down things and then try to assemble them together. So this is a very unique way and uh, we are very uh, kind of motivated or inspired by this uh, way of fungal life. Uh, however, <laughs> there are some limitations with this process because this is uh, the bottom up uh, growth can be slow, it might be difficult to scale up. So this, this is why we then said, let's forget these, <laughs> the bottom up uh, cultivation, just uh, let's grow mycelium as efficiently as we can in a submerged liquid fermentation and see if we can make anything useful out of that, uh, for example, a leather-like material. Manu, next please. So, <clears throat> and we then use this uh, liquid fermented uh, mycelium. And actually quite a long time, we then tried to find the optimal processing methods, dif different uh, conditions, uh, how to cast this um, mycelium into a, a film. And we have now uh, found out a very good process that enables us to make this uh, continuous production of, of the uh, fungal uh, leather-like material um, and uh, it says six days but I think like now our process is maybe something like four or five days maximum uh, so it's quite fast compared to, to some other methods. Manu next please. And uh, what we come up with is this material that uh, uh, we call it filumia <laughs> but it's, uh, it's a nice uh, leather-like material it's uh, non-woven um, it's 100% bio-based, so we don't have a backing uh, structure or any uh, other layers. We don't have a textile uh, sheet there. Um, we can grow the material from organic side streams. Uh, there is no harmful chemicals used for the processing. Um, the material is biodegradable. Um, as I said, the production is very scalable because we work with the bioreactors, and these can be uh, scaled up to hundreds of thousands of liters in principle, and or not only in principle, because these factories exist, uh, especially in the bioethanol field. Um, because this scalable uh, production way, we can also uh, uh, achieve production by the meter uh, in a roll-to-roll -roll fashion uh, kind of uh, production. And because of this, the price is quite competitive and uh, the quality is very consistent. 
Manu, next, please. So we demonstrated this production and uh, kind of the biggest sheet that we have made is uh, 22 centimeters by three meters or a bit more. Um, of course, this is kind of a demonstration and uh, the industry, for example, requires a one meter wide uh, uh, like rolls of, of material. Uh, this was done at our pilot line at VTT and we have bigger equipment also, but uh, then for example, for that one meter wide uh, materials, one needs to then scale up the production somewhere else. Um, next, please. And this video, hopefully it starts. Uh, it shows how we cast the mycelium on, onto this plastic moving belt. And uh, we are casting it uh, one meter per minute. And it's quite slow, but it's, uh, it, it really is moving. So um, after this casting, the film is dried and we are uh, then end up with the uh, non-woven material. So I think we can go to the next slowly. Yeah, so uh, the material is, uh, we say it's versatile in use because we can easily uh, apply some patterning to the material. We can make, um, uh, well, in the picture you see kind of what kind of patterns we have used, but in principle one can use whatever pattern one can uh, use as a template. The thickness can be very easily controlled. Uh, also, colors can be blended in, so the, kind of this uh, solvent dyeing process. And because we are working in this uh, liquid form, um, we can blend in different uh, uh, kind of uh, reinforcing uh, polymers or fibers, and also uh, these colors. And uh, this was a nice example, this marble effect, um, that we mix different colors uh, and end up with, with this uh, sort of marble-like uh, uh, appearance that demonstrates the uh, liquid form of the material before before the casting. So next, please. And um, we, of course, uh, studied the material quite heavily and especially the tensile strength. Uh, here we have reached like uh, mid-level, low to mid-level animal leather uh, qualities. Um, but there are some things that need to be improved. Um, and it's a research project. We are still continuing with this, uh, for example, impregnation and water resistance, or like water, it's like uh, it is resistant to water, but it's not water repellent. So uh, these kind of aspects we need to study more. Also colors and dyeing and color fastness and, and these sort of aspects. Um, one in interesting point is fire resistance, which might be also quite useful for some applications. Um, also, end of life, maybe we go to next slide. Then we have studied uh, the degradation of this material. Um, so uh, we see we can study this by composting and aquatic uh, biodegradation tests. And in the compost, in the pictures, you see that after three weeks, our material is almost uh, uh, gone, but uh, leather and PVC uh, fabrics are still actually not not much change has happened, and um, uh, it takes a bit more than a month to compost the material. Uh, in aquatic conditions, it's actually a bit faster. In uh, in 28 days, it is uh, degraded. So next, please. And uh, uh, the whole concept is. Uh, like uh, shown in the picture, that we start from plant uh, side streams, for example, potato peels. We can grow the mycelium, this feedstock, um, produce the material, uh, use it in, in a product. Hopefully the product will be then in use for a long time. Currently there is no recycling process for mycelium, maybe in the future, but at the, for the moment there is no, and uh, that's why biodegradation is very important. And uh, this we have now shown that it's possible and we can uh, see that through this biodegradation, 
it returns the nutrients or the kind of the raw material to nature to further growth of uh, again plants and foods and and then to complete the cycle and uh, <clears throat> if we look at this uh, 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 cycling of uh, fungal materials it's, it's very similar of course to how fungi work in nature and my next please uh, we've been lately very inspired by uh, the natural materials that uh, mushrooms make or fungi make. And this Fomes Pomentarius uh, is a nice example because uh, there are these handicraft uh, persons who can turn this mushroom into a leather like material. We wanted to study this more. Manu, next. So, what is quite remarkable for the mycelium is that when it degrades the wood and it's decomposing the wood, it uh, then eventually wants to uh, reproduce. So it wants to make the mushroom structure and it will grow out from the tree. And from this simple mycelium, it differentiates into uh, very different uh, tissues. And this is quite uh, exciting how the genetic information in the fungus determines if it uh, starts to produce a crust layer or, or a foamy context layer or these highly aligned uh, tubular structures that have material properties like uh, uh, more, more like wood. Um, and Manu, next please. And a nice uh, tool is uh, uh, microcomputer tomography. Um, here, this data allows us to make a 3D reconstruction of the mushroom and then to uh, uh, analyze the mycelium structure on a very uh, efficient way because we can then uh, look at the porosity of the material in different regions, also the kind of branching in different areas and uh, start to learn how the mycelium differentiates in the, in the mushroom. And Manu, next, please. I think this then concludes kind of the um, talk with uh, the life cycle and the mode of life of, of uh, fungi and how the mycelium uh, degrades materials to make new material and how the genes affect the structure and kind of this bottom up biofabrication is, is really uh, the key here. and the, then uh, this mode of life is maybe that we should uh, try to embrace in the society as a whole to to see materials flowing uh, from uh, from the source to 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 the end end of life and and circling uh, no no waste in the in the process uh, being produced. So thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thanks.